Hello again. And today we're going to continue talking about happiness, but particularly about the Hellenistic philosophers and how they want to talk about happiness. Um, <clears throat> we're going to do these segments as shorter videos, and I actually mean that this time because I'm only going to cover one chunk of each uh, Hellenistic philosophy at a time. So we're going to start with where your book starts, the Cynics, then we'll go on to the Epicureans and the Stoics, and finally the Skeptics. Um, so, uh, Basically, uh, Hellenistic philosophy is the philosophy that comes after the fall of Alexander the Great's empire. And it's called Hellenistic because Helen, to be a Helen or a Hellenophyte is to be Greek, basically. It's Greek philosophy that spread all over the world. Um, a lot of it coming from Athens. So what we're doing is we're going to look at the cynics first and then carry through. Um, I will talk about what kind of happiness is going on here as well. If you watch my video on Aristotle, um, Aristotle talked about happiness as eudaimonia, the great souled man, the good life, and uh, the telos of all man's, uh, you know, laboring, struggles, suffering, strife, and uh, effort. Uh, and it was all to be happy, the for the sake of which, that all of the for the sake of which is a for, happiness, that which all things are subservient to and add to or detract from, but is itself wanted only for itself. Well, the Hellenistic philosophers all believed in a different kind of happiness than Aristotle's. Uh, Eudaimoniac happiness was an extremely high bar to shoot for, uh, very difficult to achieve, and not many people got there. But these folks had different, much, let's say, lower bars, and they were dealing with a very tumultuous time. Uh, after Alexander the Great's empire broke up, uh, there was a lot of warring factions, different people fighting here and there. Uh, they drove Aristotle out, um, you know... Socrates had died. It's a rough time. Uh, so you had to deal with the worries and woes of the world being horrific and bad. And these folks tried to figure a way to do that um, through a type of happiness called ataraxia. Um, or ataraxia, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it comes from the privative a uh, or a, meaning not. And then uh, take, uh, something like the tarke. Hold on. Uh, tarke, tarake, sorry, tarake, uh, and tarake means trouble or um, disturbance. So to be untroubled or undisturbed, uh, to have calmness of soul, they say, to um, have tranquility, uh, free, uh, a sort of freedom from anxiety. Disturbed, uh, undisturbedness, untroubledness, unperturbedness, all those are words, I swear. Um, or uh, equanimity, if you want to use like a nice $2 word or something along those lines. All right, so how do we get to this state of calm, state of lack of anxiety, this state of sort of like equilibrium of sorts where nothing phases us anymore and we're going to be happy in this sort of way? Well, the cynics, uh, known uh, in the Greek as the kunaikos, um, uh, that means dog-like. They were the dog-like philosophers, and this will become apparent in a little bit. But let's talk about this first. Antisthenes and tis the knees. Antisthenes. Okay. Again, that's how you pronounce ancient Greek by each vowel group. Antis or anti the knees. Anyway, Antisthenes was a follower or disciple of Socrates. Um, he followed him around his youth, he followed him around his adult, he was at the trial, um, and after Socrates got executed, uh, this kind of like destroyed Antisthenes and he stopped being an aristocrat, stopped uh, living the, on the high hog, if you will, you know, gave away all of his money, started dressing in commoner clothes or the clothes of a laborer um, and uh, you know just said look you need to live the simple life if you really want to be happy uh, all of those things that you own end up owning you and you worry about them and they cause a lot of anxiety and disturbance so live the simple life that's the best route to happiness if you don't have stuff to worry about it makes it a lot easier right okay so he um, had a few disciples, 
as well. Uh, his most famous one was Diogenes of Sinope, or Diogenes the Cynic, not to be confused with Diogenes Laertes, who wrote Eminent Lives of Great Philosophers. I know you guys were thinking that's who I was talking about because you were like, which Diogenes, right? When you're sitting around the coffee table, chatting with your friends about different Diogenes, right? No, I'm kidding. Um, Diogenes of Sinope, or Diogenes the Cynic, he's actually not as famous as Laertes because he wrote a lot of stuff about a lot of different philosophers. So just as FYI, if you say Diogenes, and it does actually matter that somebody needs to know who we're clarifying about, <laughs> the Cynic is good enough, or of Sinope is very specific. And he, uh, you know, lived, at, you know, at the time after basically uh, Socrates was executed and during Plato's time and whatnot too. Uh, Antisthenes was a near contemporary with Plato, as the book says. And he also goes with lead the simple life. And uh, he's the cynic that they named the actual tradition after, even though he wasn't the first one. The first one was Antisthenes. Diogenes is, them, however, by far the most famous. And also, oddly enough, the only one of probably any of the philosophers in your book. Well, no, there's two places in your book where I feel like your author, McGee, gets, the, um, gets, gets this right. And the cynics part is good, and the part on Hume is good. But um, otherwise, McGee is generally not very good about stuff. And even here, it's a little weird. He says you would call the uh, cynics the dropouts. Okay, now first, before I get into their actual philosophy, let's disambiguate or make clear or perspicuous what we mean by cynic. We do not mean the modern term of what a cynic means in our current vernacular lexicon or vocabulary. If you will, a cynic in the modern sense that we are not utilizing here is somebody who thinks the worst of everyone, that everyone is out for their own and that nobody actually cares about anything. They're extremely selfish or self-oriented and you think the worst of humans all the time. To be cynical is to always think, or to have a cynical point of view is to always think that it's probably the worst thing that somebody would do or the worst thing that somebody could uh, think of or whatever. It's, it's just to constantly think that the negatives, what's, what's going to be riding over here. You know, it's always going to be that way. Um, everybody's out for their own kind of view. That is not what the cynics of the Hellenistic era thought at all. And that is not where this, where, I'm not actually even sure why the etymology um, but at any rate, uh, well, I mean, kind of, they didn't care much for what we would call um, civilized society. So uh, they may, you might want to say that they looked cynically upon that. But um, at any rate, so Diogenes the Cynic, uh, very famous. Uh, your book got right about him. Um, he uh, was basically the first shock rocker of philosophy. He was your... Um, you know, your uh, Alice Cooper, your Marilyn Manson, or your, uh, I don't know, whoever your shock rocker is today, if they even have one, I'm not sure. Somebody who really just gets out there, like Gigi Allen of the past, too. That's another one of those shock rockers, really in your face. And he tried to do a, a sort of teach by example sort of thing. So leaving the simple life is one thing, but also he believed that we should lead a life of virtue like Socrates, these folks also claim Socrates as their uh, originator, even though the first cynic we claim was Antisthenes, he claims that he learned from Socrates. Because as you recall in our uh, lectures on Socrates, Socrates used to go around barefoot in a dirty toga, you know, and he was pot-bellied and snub-nosed, and he didn't have great wealth, and he didn't take money from anybody and all this sort of stuff. So in a certain sense, Antisthenes isn't, um, uh, not following the ways of Socrates. He's actually very much uh, more so in the vein of Socrates, uh, even more so than Plato, perhaps. Plato had an academy, a school, where he um, charged money for people to come learn from him. Um, philosophy and these dialogues, and there were teachers, and, you know, rich, elite male Athenians who were teens would come to learn from Plato and pay vast sums of money for it. Uh, and Tisthenes did not do this. People just followed him around and he did, you know, virtuous, simple stuff and they, you know, followed by example kind of stuff. He wrote nothing down. Diogenes wrote nothing down. Uh, we only have stories of these people um, from others, testimonia, much like all of our pre-Socratic philosophers, because they didn't find that to be of true value. Virtue, they said, was valuable and things 
were either of true value or customary value or false value. And they claimed that we should only live a life of virtue and true value. And when it comes to custom, we should discard it because it is not actually valuable to us. So uh, things that they believed in, or didn't believe in rather, no government. They thought the government was a false imposition that we created. We as human beings got together and customarily like to have governments so that we can keep some people in and some people out and put some people in jail and expel some people from the city and uh, you know this, that, and the other. So no government, no borders, none of that nonsense. He just thinks that we're all just humans and um, we all just live on this planet. No private property. You can't really own anything, really, they say. Uh, not even your body. It dies whenever it feels like or gets sick whenever it wants. Um, someone can come club you if they feel like it and take anything they want from you. The government taxes you. The government can take whatever they want from you, generally speaking. Um, any large group of people with guns um, or, you know, weapons, basically. You know, a large man <laughs> that, that knows more martial arts than I do. There's no such thing as private property. We just pretend like we have. I mean, the, the communists think that private property is bad for you anyways because it makes you greedy and selfish. And famously, Mao Zedong once said that property is fact, right? That when you take from everybody else, that means that you're taking it just for yourself and you're not sharing with everybody. Remember what they told you in your elementary school to share with your with your friends and, and all of your all of your uh, classmates because everybody in your class should be your friend, right? <laughs> well, at any rate, um, no private property. And along with that, no marriage because basically marrying meant that you as a woman were essentially owned by someone and uh, therefore marriage was a type of domestic slavery and sex uh, slavery. You know, you had to produce preferably male heirs, right? and continue the bloodline, keep the family lineage clean of any bastards or, you know, um, other stuff like that. Athenian women weren't allowed to leave the houses without chaperones, except for sometimes to go to the Agora or the marketplace, and usually they were still chaperoned. So women were closely guarded and generally cloistered um, in this era. So marriage, as soon as that happened, that's the end of your social life pretty much, except for with other married women and always chaperones. Uh, there's some other weird examples that have to do with the Illusion Mysteries and some Dionysian stuff. But uh, in a general sense, um, marriage was uh, not uh, a good deal for women. So he said, nah, marriage, marriage is a customary, unnecessary thing. We don't need to have that. And I mean, even in a lot of ways right now, I'm unmarried, but I mean, I'm married in all the ways anyone thinks about that matter. I mean, like I share a bank account with my fiance. Uh, we own our home together. We have our condo. I mean, well, it's a home, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, we uh, share everything, um, but we're not married technically. But I've been together with her 17 years, which is like two and a half marriages. So you can, you know, can it about saying that, you know, we don't know what it's like to be married. We've been together that long. I mean, that's long enough. We've been living together under the same roof for about 15 years of that. So at any rate, no organized religion, another shackle or fetter of customary value and of uh, a way to enslave and and uh, and to control you um, just like marriage is controlling you just like private property is owning and controlling you and the government is controlling you none of these things religion's fine so long as it's not organized as soon as we start organizing all of a sudden it's a strange thing it doesn't matter if you're buddhist christian islamic or otherwise there's always some sort of go around where money can come in and like help you out somehow, you know, like Buddhists don't believe that we should have attachments. And one of the, one of the four noble truths is to remove your, yourself from all attachments. Well, how the hell do we get golden temples and Buddha statues like that? And do you know how much it costs to feed the fucking carp in the pond? And, you know, those giant goldfish and stuff. Oh my God. Um, but at any rate, um, or, you know, um, indulgences, that was one of the big reasons that the, uh, Protestant religion, Protestant religions even formed why there was, you know, a, a great reformation and uh, the breaking or the great schism off from the church was because one of the big reasons was they were selling indulgences, which was to say that you could pay money to the ch Catholic church and they would then say that you would be absolved of all your sins and would go to heaven as a result of paying money. Oh, 
<laughs> my good God. And that's also when they invented limbo, so they you know, were unsure. If you just paid some money and you thought they were in limbo, uh, then that, that would move them right along, you know? Um, nonsense. Uh, but organized religion has done a lot of bad things in the world in the name of God. And standardly speaking, most of the major world religions have been very peaceable, very nice, and um, have, you know, had a lot of, uh, you know, their actual tenets are very good. That's why the converts to other religions like Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, and whatever, are usually much more faithful to the actual tenets of the religion than people that were born into it and raised with it, because a lot of times, you know, you just act like whatever your society acts like and not strictly follow whatever your religion says. I mean, if you're following the Bible totally, 100%, then you got to follow Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and that means you can't have a cheeseburger or a piece of pizza because uh, you can't have your milk plates and your meat plates touch, and you can't have any pork at all, so no bacon for you. Um, and eating shellfish makes you an abomination. Plant crops of different types in the same row, also an abomination punishable by death. Cheating is uh, inside of marriage can be get, getting you a stoning to death. I mean, come on, we don't do any of that stuff. But yet, we still think that sex between um, you know the same sex people, homosexuality, is wrong because in the Old Testament they make some mention of it. But we don't care about any of those other rules for some reason because we consider sex to be so much more important uh, for some reason. In fact, if you want to look at who the villain in the Bible is, the most frequently, it's not Satan. The evil spirit that is sometimes referred to as Satan or the devil only shows up a few times in the Old Testament and a very few times in the New Testament. But the tax collector, that guy is always the bad guy in, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. I mean, when does Jesus get pissed off? He only gets pissed off like twice. Once when his disciples fall asleep on his ass while he's asking them to pray, and then once before that, he gets Jersey style table flipping at, with the money changers being in the house of God or, you know, in the temple or the church, if you want to call it, you want to Christianize it or whatever. Um, he says that they shouldn't be changing money or doing commerce in the house of God. So no spaghetti dinners and no fundraisers inside the church, right? Okay. At any rate, just saying organized religion he was against. You can be religious. He doesn't care so long as you're not oppressing others or shackling others with it. Uh, no slaves for all the reasons earlier put up and no masters, none of that stuff. And when asked once what citizen he was or where he was from, he said, I am a citizen of the world, which is our first cosmopolitan statement, which cosmopolitan just means, you know, you're from the cosmos, meaning the order or from at all. And politics being a political order or government or place or uh, polis, a city-state, right? So to be a cosmopolitan is to be of the great order or of the, you know, the, the, the city of all or something like that, which is to say when we talk about cosmopolitanism, we usually mean having uh, a lot of different um, cultures and things sync together and be part of that. But basically he didn't believe in being, he said he was a citizen of the world because he was saying that there is no such thing as citizenship or if there is, we're all part of it, all of us as human beings. So no government, no private property, no marriage, no organized religion, no slaves, no masters. What does this sound like to anybody? Has anybody got something that they think that this sounds like? Some other philosophy they may have heard of before? Possibly. Anarchy, right? Anarchy. Okay, I can't spell it. I'm dyslexic. But at any rate, um, so these are the first anarchists, really. Anarchy does not mean chaos. That's a different sort of thing. I mean, it usually has chaos involved with it. But anarchy just means no rigid hierarchy or hierarchical structure. Um, and people say, oh, that'll never work. Oh, that could never happen. Well, technically, um, anthropologically modern human beings have been around for the last, ooh, I don't know, like 40 to 80,000 years, let's say. And we've only had domestication of animals and agriculture for the last mm, 10 to 15,000 years, which is when we started forming cities um, and stopped being hunter-gatherers for the most part, even though there are still some hunter-gatherers that exist in the worst places on the planet, like the Sankum, Sub-Saharan Africa, the 
out back in Australia where there are actually places that are just naturally radioactive and can cause cancer just from being near them. The Inuits of the uh, upper Alaska and Canada. I mean, these are some pretty horrible locations when it comes to survival, but yet humans still live there and they still choose to have what we would call uncivilized lives in hunter-gatherer societies because they still find value in not having rigid governments, not having serious private property ideas, having weak or odd sort of marriage ritualistic stuff. Generally speaking, their organized religions are nothing like the kind of religions that we have today that have massive structures um, built for them, as well as massive um, organizational structures with hierarchies and priests and uh, different ranks of different things and all that stuff. No, and definitely, generally speaking, not slaves or masters. All that comes about once we start having agriculture and we start st staying put in particular places. And where are the places we stay put in and, and want to take root? Well, first the Fertile Crescent, because it's called that, or that same area called the Middle East that we've been fighting over for since literally we started agriculture and farming because it was one of the first arguable places between the Tigris and Euphrates, right? And they've always been fighting over that little patch of dirt forever. Everyone who's ever been there, um, I've taken lots of history and it's not just Israeli, Palestinian, it's like all the way back with limited times of not fighting when larger powers have forced uh, peace violently, but whatever. Um, basically all of the farmers and bean counters took over all the good places on the planet where it was easy to grow, you know, stuff and where the hunter gatherers could easily work five to 15 hours a week gathering stuff and have the rest of the time off and hunting and spend the rest of the time doing, you know, whatever, telling stories, hanging out with people, having sex, I don't know, making mash that can be made into alcohol, which is something that happens. There's a really fun um, anthropology story about this that an uh, anthropologist is there to try and find out some stories about stuff and it started raining and as soon as it rains a certain um, plant uh, appears and then they just stop everything that they're doing to make it into this sort of alcoholic mash that they can make out <laughs> so you had to sit around with them while they were getting drunk for a week while the rains came um, it's unpredictable so they just have to do it when it happens but regardless the point being here uh, is that we actually lived in a state of anarchy with none of this stuff for the majority of human history. Domestication and agriculture is when we started to have rigid hierarchies. It's when we initially started to see um, pandemics and large amounts of humans living together on top of each other instead of having smaller bands of human beings, generally speaking, no larger than 200, uh, generally smaller than 50 or around there-ish in that sort of sense. Because once you get that many people together, people start fighting with each other and then they break off into different groups or they fight and kill each other and whoever's left standing are the people that are now that people. Um, chimps do this as well, by the way, just FYI. Um, and so do we. I mean, they have really high, uh, what we'll call, say, murder rates um, in hunter-gatherer societies that we can tell. And also the current ones that still exist, there's a, there's a fair amount of murder that happens as well. Um, because when people disagree, either they leave or they fight and sometimes to the death. But again, it's not large scale. It's not like they're bombing people. It's not like we're killing tons of children or you know, causing massive famine or disease. Um, and because of living so close to our animals and because of eating all the same food, uh, we get, again, like I said, major diseases starting to ha crop up in humanity. Um, and then also because we can hoard food now, certain people have more of it than others. And there is where we start to see difference in class that is serious and significant. Sure, there are tribal leaders and elders and, you know, um, soothsayers and healers and whatnot. But like the difference in their status is not so great compared to like what a billionaire's status in our country is versus what a person who's living at the poverty line is. If you think about, for instance, uh, Epstein, who recently died uh, in prison, um, he had basically all of the money in the world and was running a child trafficking ring, supposedly. Again, you can't say for sure because it didn't, he didn't get tried in court and, um, you know, it wasn't um, proven that he was guilty. But um, it's pretty apparent if you watched anything on this or listened to any of the witnesses, which there are many, 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 many 
uh, that he was very, very, very guilty. But because of all of his money and lawyers and power and what was going on, he treated very differently and was a totally different sort of class of person than somebody at a lower level, much like Trump can do whatever the hell he wants. And if you did anything like that as a normal person or a below, you know, or close to the poverty line person, none of that stuff would happen. Or if you even look at, let's say, systemic racism, the vigilante, we'll say that in scare quotes, that shot two people who were protesting, or if they want to say rioting, but whatever, um, when he, you know, has a gun in his hand, is walking towards the police and puts it down, and then they take him in with his hands up, being light, he gets to do that, whereas the person that's incited these riots earlier was a black man who got shot in the back seven times while not holding a gun, not running away, and that wasn't even him holding a gun or doing any of those sort of things, okay? So, like, do you see a difference here? Okay, that's, you know, rigid hierarchy that's been changed to make systemic things very strong. Okay, um, now that aside, what we're trying to get at here is that we wanna get rid of all that hierarchy and for the majority of human history, we live without it. any of that sort of strongly put together um, uh, governmental stuff, okay? Religious stuff, bonds of legal and religious marriage and slavery and slavery and all of that ownership of massive wealth and other people being massively poor and subsisting on almost nothing. Now, this is an idea of trying to share with one's others and tribes and live simply and not want for such things that are of only customary value uh, rather than things that are of true value, which we will get to in just a minute. But again, um, just to drive the point home a little further about our earlier hunter-gatherer selves as humans, um, you know, they also um, were an inch and a half taller than our anthropologically modern humans that started doing agriculture and farming because they were eating mostly grain or cereal crops, which are basically a bunch of carbohydrates and sugar, which lack a lot of the nutrients that we need to grow big and strong. Um, which is what all these diets that are about are, are telling us and why the food pyramid was a crock of shit that they fed us as children. Oh, people in my generation were fed as children that grains need to be at the top and we need to have six to eight servings of that a day or something like that, whereas you don't need to do that at all, um, nor do you even need milk. We're the only creatures on the planet that drink milk after weaning. Uh, and half the population, more than half the population of the planet is lactose intolerant, including myself, which is to say that milk is very bad for me, generally speaking. But I it's a sad fact, but nonetheless, um, if you've ever wondered why most of the, the Asian cuisine from East Asia, like China, is milk-free, that's because most um, genetically Asian folks who are from that area lack the gene that we need to process lactose. Um, so at any rate, uh, and thus our lactose intolerant. Um, <clears throat> nonetheless, and we don't get a lot of milk until we have domesticated animals like goats, sheep, and uh, cows. Um, so, you know, that's that's a thing. You eat a lot less meat also as a result of this sort of caveman or paleo or ketogenic diet or whatever. But like fruits, nuts, stuff we can pick up and stuff that we can kill and eat uh, is fine. You know, uh, they lived in pretty good health until about age 35 and died. But I mean, honestly, that was still the average age of death for most people in this era anyways, regardless of whether or not they were living in cities. The only difference is, even though the hunter-gatherers were better skilled and more able to, um, you know, fight and hunt and all that sort of stuff, um, and taller and stronger, uh, the population boomed a hundredfold. So while one stronger, faster, smarter hunter-gatherer um, may be able to beat off a few or beat up a few or take on a few, um, you know, farmers that are weak and uh, malnutrition, uh, one hunter-gatherer does not defeat a hundred farmers. So then they kick them off the land that was good and easy to live off of. And then they had to live in the worst, we pushed them to the worst 
possible places on the planet where no one else wanted to live, yet humans have still decided to live in those places because they still find this way of life, this simple way of life, valuable. And we still want to change that. We want to take that away from them and cosmopolitanize them in a way of globalization and make sure that they can be just like us, right? Modern first world people. Um, and a lot of people just immediately just seed to that and go that direction because it's easier. It is. It's not an easy life in a lot of ways. Um, but it is a life where you don't have to work all the time in a certain sense. Um, not like we do some sort of nine to five and there's not large accumulations of wealth and all this sort of rigid hierarchy crap. So at any rate, anarchy or something like that is not in itself chaos and absolute violence and disorder. It can be ordered very, very much so, just not rigidly and just not um, vast schemes of, of this. Now, Let's talk about true value versus customary value. Because this is where it gets fun, folks. Okay, so. No public-private distinction. That's the first one. So, Diogenes the Cynic said, What's the difference between when you're in public and when you're by yourself? Well, generally speaking, we're much more disgusting as human beings, customarily anyways, um, due to public versus private. Do you like to let a rip of a giant fart on your first date with somebody? Do hmm? you even want them to know if you go to the bathroom to take a shit? Holy crap, oh my God, oh no. I mean, in fact, a lot of times I think the marking of a good relationship is one in which you can fart around your significant other or use the bathroom. I mean, everybody poops. I know there's a book. Um, <laughs> we all uh, we all defecate and eliminate and expectorate, and um, most of us masturbate. Usually, people don't masturbate if they can't, or if they're religiously forbidden and therefore make a choice to do such a thing, or if they're asexual. I mean, these are things that that happen. Um, but generally speaking, everybody masturbates, but do you do that in public? Do you piss and shit and eliminate or spit or whatever in public? No, it's considered uncouth and vulgar and whatever. But Diogenes used to defecate or shit in public. He used to urinate in public, sometimes on people. Um, he would masturbate in public and try to hit people with it. Now, people didn't put up with this. They threw stones at him and shoot him away and all sorts of stuff. But he is also, your, your book says he did things so, um, how did they put it? Uh, they said that Diogenes did stuff that was so ridiculous that they can't even mention it here. Committing, this is page 41, committing flagrant acts of public indecency. I mean, yeah, he did. But we all do these things. Why is it that we have to have this public-private distinction? Seriously. Or sex, that's usually also a, a private sort of thing. We're generally not public with that. Although, not always. I mean, there are sex clubs and orgies and things like that. And if you look at Game of Thrones, and this is actually part of some medieval cultures, um, the wedding and bedding ceremony, where we actually watch people copulate to make sure that the uh, offspring that they're having are in fact theirs, so that we can continue bloodlines um, appropriately for said dynasties or hierarchies or birthrights and such that we have for kings and queens and nobles and you know all of that aristocracy that the cynics did not believe in at all. In fact, they claim that uh, Diogenes lived in a funeral urn. So if you don't have this book, uh, that's a base relief picture of him living in a, uh, nope, there we are, funeral urn. Okay, uh, because urns back then, we didn't have the ability to cremate uh, humans the way we do now. Um, yeah. Cremation is extremely difficult. If you actually try to like burn a body, you won't be very successful at burning the bones and all of that, um, unless you have a really super serious furnace. Um, like just throwing some gasoline on somebody and burning them will leave behind a ton of evidence. 
um, I've watched a lot of um, Snapped and what they might refer to as murder porn, but like shows that talk about serial killers and people killing people and, you know, 48 hours and all that other stuff. Um, just trying to straight up burn somebody's body does not work properly. And they didn't have the tiny urns that we have today that they put the, the ashes of the person in. And those are not all of their ashes, by the way. They only give you some. But urns, which they put people in or buried people in back in the day, um, were large vases you could fit a whole body into. So um, <laughs> Diogenes sort of metaphorically would lived in a turned over one outside the city walls um, with the dogs and the strays and the curs and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, he's saying, well, while this is uh, also my house, it's <laughs> what you can bury me in when I die because it serves just as well as a house to keep the rain off my head, right? He didn't have any real possessions, and, you know, um, he would eat out of the trash, they would say, and eat leftovers that other people threw away, or raw meat. So the question of edible versus inedible. Can you eat it or not? You can eat raw steak. The only reason we don't eat raw pork or raw chicken is because of trichinosis and salmonella. And those didn't exist until we started keeping a lot of those animals together. Although trichinosis, mm, a lot before, I mean, part of the reason why kosher um, food doesn't allow you to eat swine, or pigs, or any cloven hoof beast is because the cloven hoof beasts are more likely to get parasites to go through their cloven hoof, goats too, um, which would make you sick. So some people think that, um, you know, the Jews or God or somebody figured this out and thus, you know, tried to make eating rituals be such that it would prevent you from dying or living longer as a result of, you know, eating in a more clean fashion. I mean, technically, kosher food and halal food are prepared very specifically and specially so that they are more safe and sanitary to eat, which will keep you from just dying of random, like, diseases or botulism or whatever the hell. I mean, like it's, and again, life was very fragile in the ancient world. I keep mentioning this. A lot of people died. Half of all humans didn't make it to maturity. The question is whether the food's edible or inedible. If any of you have ever worked in service, um, you know, and had to, you know, work at a, you know, where they have food and they take it back or they even clear tables, people waste a lot of fucking food that's totally edible. I mean, they really do. It's pretty insane. And now for a personal story that actually has to do with this. When I was at Emory and very poor, and not that I'm not still, Emory is a very rich school, but I was part of a group of people who uh, were in a club called Art Core, and we used to have little art showings and we'd have keggers and things like that with the art showing and whatnot, but the school wouldn't pay for alcohol. Um, so we had to come up with ways to pay for and fund our events uh, alcohol included. They also didn't give us very much money in the first place, just because they, as usual, didn't consider the arts very important. So we had to figure out ways to raise funds. So what we would do is we'd go across the street from memory. There used to be a Panera Bread right there. And every day at the end of every day, they do this at Panera still and a lot of other bagel places like Einstein's and whatnot. They take all the day old bagels and pastries and scones and things like that. They do this at Starbucks too. And they throw them out. Uh, they put them into giant trash bags and they throw them out. Or uh, if they're being decent, uh, they'll take them to homeless shelters and then they'll feed them to the homeless the next day because day old bagels are still pretty damn good and scones and all that other stuff. I mean, it's not as fresh as it could be. And certainly if I'm paying money for it, I'd prefer a fresh scone or a fresh bagel or a fresh, you know, crumb cake or cookie or whatever, or bread. But being poor uh, and in college, I used to go dumpster diving with my friends and we would get giant bags, trash bags filled with unspoiled, un, you know, nothing thrown on them, bagels and um, other pastries that weren't put in the trash because somebody had eaten them and thrown them out, even though for Diogenes, he would eat stuff that people had eaten off of and then just keep eating it. Now, uh, nowadays we would be worried about this because of germs, especially in our current moment, but they had no conception of things like that. Um, at the time. In fact, he had really poor hygiene. He didn't shower or bathe pretty much ever unless it was absolutely necessary. Like if he got a rash or something like that. And he would wear no clothes when it was especially hot. And you'd only wear clothing when it was very cold, generally speaking, because clothing, optional. 
you only wear that because of custom, not because of anything else. You only don't fart in public or burp in public or have sex in public or masturbate in public because of custom. It's not valuable in and of itself. It's just customary that we don't do those things. It's customary that you don't eat after other people, double dip or do any of those other things. I mean, sanitariness aside, we're not really concerned with that at this point, but the question is, is it edible or is it not? Also ugly. A lot of people don't want to have ugly vegetables or vegetables with pockmarks or things like that. We've done a lot of work to try and make our vegetables look nice, even though they don't have to be edible and we waste tons of food as a result of that. Um, it really, we do. It has true value, yet via custom, we decide that we're not going to eat that or have that sort of you know public-private distinction or any of that sort of stuff. So again, Diogenes was putting this in everybody's face by you know going naked when it was really hot or you know uh just being dirty most of the time why is it a, why does it matter like, oh the smell oh god they smell so bad i was like well you know potato potato i really despise the smell of most perfumes and colognes they're really heavy and horrible you ever been in an elevator with somebody who's wearing too much cologne or too much perfume and it's just like <sighs> so i mean you know the human smell doesn't have to be considered so odious and awful or whatever um and uh let's carry on with some of the other things before we, we get to our finale here of stuff that we think is ridiculous um you know uh, so also we have uh some stuff about uh greek versus non-greek or fashion like for instance we are currently or at least i am currently in South Florida, in Tampa. It is, mm, I don't know, probably almost 90 degrees outside right now, somewhere in the 80s. It's humid and horribly hot. I am currently wearing um, dress pants, a vest, a, you know, a sleeve garment here, um, and a hat, although that's not necessary anymore. At one point, this was a necessary piece of uh, you know, attire and a tie that's strangulating me in some respects. This little tie bar here and all that, the pins just because we're talking about that, that's right. Uh, so at any rate, um, what I'm trying to get at here is this. Why in a climate like this is the appropriate work attire or dress attire for somebody this monkey suit? In South Africa, all of the men wear three-piece suits, even though it's freaking insanely hot. In Italy, none of the men wear shorts. If you see people in shorts in Italy, it's people who are tourists, okay? It's just not a thing. And if I decided that I wanted to wear a sundress, you would think that I had some sort of gender thing going on. Now, I could, that's fine, I don't care. But um, it would be weird if I showed up to class in a dress. In fact, also, also you know, I think that the appropriate attire in this climate is probably uh, tank top and booty shorts. So, you know, I see my female students sometimes wearing those sorts of clothing garments, and I am jealous. I can't wear that to teach in, and I can't garner respect as a male in that sort of stuff, at least not in the current position that I am. Do you think that I wear this to go walk my dogs? I do not. In fact, actually, when I was in Walmart at one point, I ran into one of my students, and I was just wearing shorts and a t-shirt, and you know, um, a Panama hat, because I do like hats. Um, and uh, she didn't recognize me at first and was like, oh, whoa, uh, I didn't recognize you. That's a good costume. And I was like, well, this is one of them. I have many because these are just customary things that we wear. What about the regalia that we wear for graduation that you see your professors in, those giant wizard robes and the wizard hat? Why do we have those? Oh, for the same reason that we have to wear a suit, because the fucking British conquered the world and Great Britain uh, or the UK is a miserably cold, rainy climate um, where the sun never shines. Sorry if you're British um, or English or from the UK, Ireland, Scotland, United Kingdoms, etc. cetera. Um, but the climate there is not sunny and warm like it is here all the time. And as a result of them being colonial conquesting sort of folks, we all dress like this because the English happened to win. Um, a lot of wars and conquer a lot of places. Suits are all the rage for men. This is the only real attire we get. Women at least get options on dresses and 
pantsuits or not or lots of other stuff. Men basically were all resigned to having to wear button down shirts, a tie and a jack, a sports coat. Um, I wear a vest because it's still looking, you know, I guess in the appropriate fashion, but you know, I could probably get away with wearing whatever I wanted, but I'm trying to be within regs. And plus, besides, it's all like Indiana Jones once. Isn't this what a professor is supposed to dress like? You know? Um, at any rate, uh, so, you know, this is, this is my professor costume. I have others. Um, but I wear this because it's customary. And once when I was very young, um, a teenager in high school, uh, over a summer, I worked on an organic farm in North Carolina. Um, that was a commune. Also, some people lived in yurts. Um, I did not. I got to live in the house. Um, and I worked uh, a couple of days a week uh, on the farms, and they fed me and let me stay there. They also ran a camp for underprivileged children. It was a clown camp, which I decided to work at that more than farm because I really hate farming. Um, my grandparents have a farm. I have milked a cow. I have been on a farm. I have farmed. I have picked okra and all sorts of other stuff and lots of other vegetables and man i don't want to be a farmer ever i know that that seems like the simple life and the rustic life and no no i'm not doing that that's a lot of damn work it's really not for me at any rate um the point of my story was this i was out in the field with a bunch of you know liberal hippie so, sort of folks and this one dude that was there uh who also made giant puppets and did a lot of protesting um he used to wear a sundress while we were picking okra in the fields and i was not and uh, I asked him at one point, because uh, he had a girlfriend and I was very young and didn't have any knowledge about gender identity or any of those other sort of things that are LGBTQ stuff didn't really exist for me at that point in time. It was also, you know, um, the late 90s, early 2000s or something like that, I want to say. Um, so, you know, this wasn't exactly as big as it is now. Um, and I, would, you know, I asked him, so what his deal was, because he was wearing a sundress while we were out in the field picking stuff. Because uh, he had a girlfriend, which confused me because I thought he was gay because he was wearing a dress. Because at that time, I thought if you wore a dress, you were just gay. But that's not even the case at all, necessarily. Because cross-dressers don't necessarily have to be gay. Transvestites don't have to be gay. They could be on the spectrum of all sorts of different stuff. In general, love is a, in sexuality is a large, weird spectrum of things that um, you can't really pin down very well, which is why when Foucault writes a book called The History of Sexuality, it's not the history of sex because that's hard to pin down. And if you want to know a little bit more about how even weirder it gets, there are intersex people and there's a documentary on Amazon, it's free, uh, Amazon Prime, if you want to watch about this called I think Intersection. And it's really interesting because uh, like I think it's one in 15,000 people are born um, with ambiguous um, genetics, uh, when it comes to their sex organs. Um, and it goes all sorts of different ways. So it's not anything like completely unified or anything. I mean, we used to call them hermaphrodites, but now the proper term is intersex. But at any rate, people are very embarrassed and don't like talking about it. And uh, while it's not super common, one in 15,000 is still pretty, that's still a lot of people. Any rate, um, he said, to me after I asked him why he was wearing a dress and it was political or about some sort of transsexualism or some sort of gendered thing, you know, because I was still a little bit with it. Um, I mean, I was on a fucking communist farm there. Um, uh, he said, it's really hot outside and sundresses are breezy and I like that. And I was like, hmm, why the hell am I wearing pants? But at any rate, that's just my point that I'm trying to get across here is that that's the case. I mean, like, oh, you could wear a kilt. But even then, that's not necessarily super acceptable. When I was in Boy Scouts, we had somebody at our summer camp, when I was working at the summer camp there, um, I'm an Eagle Scout, by the way, uh, that was from Scotland, and they were called Queen Scouts because of the Queen of England, and they wore kilts in their formal dress A's or whatever, you know, their class A uniform or whatever, and oh, God, that poor dude. He got a lot of shit for being a queen scout wearing a, uh, which is the equivalent of an eagle scout, wearing a kilt. So the queen scout wearing a skirt, right? Because of custom, we beat up on him for that as, you know, conservative, uh, you know, sort of scouts that were young and mocking of him. But Again, that's only customary. You don't have to dress a certain way. You don't have to do any of that stuff. The true value is, is it the kind of clothes that are suitable for the environment that you are currently in? Is it edible? Is it not? 
So distinctions between edible and inedible are all that matter. Distinctions between public and private aren't, don't matter at all, right? It really doesn't. Distinctions of what class you come from, what your family name is. You know, Shakespeare's famous, you know, what's in a name, a rose by any other name. It's like, it doesn't freaking matter. And human beings by color is nonsense too, because while like we are closer in genetics than any species of dog that is interbred. We are so much closer in, in, in speciation than almost any other species of animals that can breed together than anything else. Like actual race is a social construct, not something that is actually legitimately um, real. Okay. And if you don't think that's true, take a sociology or an anthropology course or just look into it a little bit because that's the truth. Culturally, yes, there is such a thing as an African American. Culturally, there is waspy white people. Culturally, there are Hispanic folks. Um, you know, culturally, there are all these different groups of different ethnicities that that have their own sorts of things. But that's all stuff that we made up that doesn't have true value, according to the cynics. That's just all custom. I mean, you might like the customs, you might not. It doesn't matter. None of that stuff is really of value. What is of value is surviving, virtue, living well, and not oppressing the shit out of other people for doing stuff a little different than you do it because of custom, right? You mock them mercilessly for their odd customs, for the way they have their hair, their turban, their skin color, the way they pray or whom they pray to or what they pray to or whether they pray at all, or if they have a God or if they don't have a God if they believe in private property, or if they don't, if they're socialists, if they're liberals, if they're capitalists, pig slime, if they're dirty pinko commies, if they're whatever you want to call them, all of, this are, all of these are social constructs, okay? None of that stuff matters. We should just live decent, simple lives of true value and stop having all of these different boundaries and borders and categories. All right, so who's up for being a cynic, huh? Who wants to be one of the dog-like philosophers, eh? Yeah. Nowadays, we call them crust punks, perhaps. You know, they live off the land. They're modern hunter-gatherers. They dumpster dive, and they live off the fat of the land that is, you know, all the shit we throw away, right? They wander, like, you know, in kung fu from town to town or in the cities and just hang out there and gather up loose stray cigarette butts and whatever loose chains they can get and, you know, states where they pay you money to recycle stuff, they get cans and do things like that. Um, and while there's no healthcare, and generally speaking, you need a social group for this to work out reasonably well, um, you know, there are people that still do this. Uh, Anarcho-communist crust punks, uh, as they call themselves sometimes. And I've met a number of those people. Believe it or not, when I was younger, I used to be a punk rocker, and I had a mohawk and blue hair and... Uh, you know, it's all punked out and stuff, but, you know, um, I'm now a philosophy professor, so this is my current attire, and I'm 36, so this is my current attire. You can't have them all forever, really. Um, so, at any rate, uh, you know, I knew some of those people, and while that is actual freedom, by the way, you don't have any shackles on you, no government, no job, no um, committed relationship, you lack basic health care, except for if you go to the emergency room, and even then they barely patch you up, and your teeth fall out, and you likely have to steal, but stealing is only um, possible if we have property, and if you don't believe in property, then it doesn't matter. So to finish the story off in a sort of interesting facet, um, uh, my sister was went to Tulane, which is in New Orleans, when Hurricane Katrina struck. She had to evacuate, and her um, apartment uh, was vacated by her and her, her roommate. And um, when they didn't, they spent the whole semester in Tennessee, because uh, University of Tennessee, the volunteers, they uh, graciously took on all a lot of the students from uh, Tulane in their architecture school and uh, let them basically seamlessly go there and then come back for the semester. So um, while they were gone for the semester, someone had broken into their place of living, uh, slept on their bed, tracked mud and dirt into the house, ate all the canned goods and food that was there, uh, 
ran up a little bit of a bill on the cable because apparently that came back on and they just started watching some pay-per-view. Um, but they left the TV, they left the computer, they left the bed, they left all the valuables. And they and her roommate was shocked and appalled and really just weirded out most of all, most of all, because they didn't take anything of value. And she said, well, why would they break in and just squat and not steal everything? And I said, well, because they have virtue, right? They, have, they, they believe that it would have been wrong of them to steal all your shit. But since you weren't using your place and you weren't using your bed and, you know, the food that was there, you know, you weren't using that either. They decided that, you know, they'd take that and watch your TV and use your DVDs, but they weren't going to steal them from you because that would be wrong, right? That would be vicious. <laughs> uh, and uh, she did not like that answer one bit. But truthfully, that was probably the type of people that busted in because otherwise, why wouldn't they have just stolen everything? Right? They still have value. They still have virtue. Uh, it's just different because it's about true value and not about customary or false value, as they say. And to finish, finish, for real, um, <clears throat> there's a, this is the most famous story of Diogenes, and it's from your book on page 41 as well. They claim that Alexander the Great once went to meet him because they heard about Diogenes the Cynic, a man who you know, masturbates and shits in public and, you know, uh, wears, goes naked when it's hot and eats out of the trash. Uh, one time he had even claimed, if only rubbing my belly could fill it as easily as satiating my sexual needs. Um, you figure it out. Um, so there are many good stories about Diogenes. The most famous is that when Alexander the Great came to visit him and his filthy hole, a, a funeral urn, right, literally, and stood in the entrance asking if there was anything that he, the ruler of the entire world, not quite true, okay, but the quote-unquote known world, uh, he stopped conquering places where almost everybody else does, Afghanistan. It's a mountainous range in wilderness and nobody ever gets past there. Not the Soviets, not Alexander the Great, not the United States, but whatever. At any rate, trying to take over Afghanistan has always been problematic for everyone. Marco Polo described it as a place that was blasted and cold and dusty, and that there were caves that you could travel through for days without seeing the sunlight. Yeah, try and take over that place. Great, great call. At any rate, um, the ruler of the entire world, Alexander the Great, he asked if there was anything that he could do for Diogenes. Diogenes replied to him, yes, you can stand out of my light. There is no doubt that he meant this figuratively as well as literally. And it is possibly the most eloquent put down of worldly values that a philosopher has ever managed to deliver. You know, I doubt that actually happened because if it did, they probably would have killed him. But they claim that this is what happened. So he just said like, you know, stop taking up my space, man. I've got my own thing. You've got your thing. You're some big conquering dude. And I live a quiet, simple life of virtue outside the city in an urn that's meant for people who are dead and I eat out of the trash and I live off of the scraps of society because they're there and I can and I still am a good person. And the first anarchist. All right, well, that's it for the cynics.